You took from us a loving mother, grandmother, sister, aunt, cousin, and friends. Behind your senseless act, we will never have another birthday, another get together, another celebration, me and her shopping, another call on the phone like we often like to do. While I was writing this, tears fell from my eyes. Thinking about what a beautiful person you took. Because of your hate, which you've learned from the internet, I'm not going to drag this out long. I just want to remember some of the things that I want you to remember some of the things that I've said to you. I've seen you a couple times in court, and you look like a young man that could be anybody's son. You don't come across to me as a racist killer, even though that's what you have done. Mistakes. Some are big, and some are small. This one here is a real big one that you can't take back. You have to live with this one, bro, just as I have to live with this every day. I don't know what your relationship with your parents are, but I'm a parent, and I feel sorry for your parents. You will never get to hug them again, like I won't. You will never get to see your grandparents again. You will never see the outside world again. I don't wish the death penalty on you. I wish they keep you alive. So you have to suffer with the thought of what you did for the rest of your life. To me, killing you is the easy way out. One day, I hope you find it in your heart to apologize to those 10 families who have shattered their lives for some <laughs> senseless, unnecessary business that you had going on with yourself. You have shattered a lot of lives here, son. I got a child your age. I know it was a mistake. It was a big one, bro. You're going to pay for this. Just find it in your heart to apologize to these people, man. I've been there, man. You've been brainwashed. The internet is the issue. They bring, you only 18. You can, obviously, you couldn't hate. You don't even know black people that much to hate them. You learned this on the internet, and it's a big mistake. I feel sorry for your mother, your mother. I don't have mine, but your mother, she's dying inside for what you've done. She can't even pick her head up behind some nonsense that you've done. And I hope you find that in your heart to apologize to these people, man. You did wrong for no reason. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry for your loss. Good morning. Your Honor, my name is Leslie Van Giesen. I represent Roberta Drury's family. My daughter, Robbie Drury, was a young woman. She was not married. She had no children. She never will. Robbie was our youngest daughter. When people ask, how many children do you have? I don't know what to say. Will I ever be able to enjoy August 11th, her birthday? May 14th, 
How will my family ever have a nice thought on a beautiful spring day? How do I look at her Christmas stocking hanging every year? Today, when I think of Robbie, I don't think of her like this. I need this picture to remind me she was a beautiful girl. I think of her alone, laying on the pavement for hours. I've never been able to see or touch her after that day. I have been profoundly changed. My life view is it's just saddened everything. Robbie's family, my family, has been permanently damaged and there is no punishment that will ever reserve, reverse our loss. Thank you. Thank you, Liz Van Giesen. I'm very sorry for your loss. Good morning. My name is Tamika. I'm the niece of Geraldine Valley. Our family's aunts are more or less our second moms. And that's what you took away from me. You took away my mom, best friend. You destroy our lives forever. It's not a day that goes by that I won't remember May 14th and being Two minutes sooner, I could have been in that store. And all I think about is, could I have saved my aunt? Could I have helped her get away from the bullets? Or could my mom be suffering more and lose her daughter, her granddaughter, and her sister? So in life, everything that happens, happens for a reason. And that's good and bad. At 18, at 19 years old, I had to bury my first son. But the pain I feel from you taking my aunt from our family will never even compare to burying my own child. This was the, a horrible crime that you committed. And I hope you do pray for forgiveness. Because you know, not forgiving, <coughs> I will be blocking my own blessing. So do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. I want you to stay alive. I want you to think about this every day of your life. Every day of your life, think about my family and the other nine families that you've destroyed forever, forever. May 14th will never be the same for me. My aunt was my grandchildren's godmother, and she was taken away on my granddaughter's birthday. My granddaughter will never be able to celebrate her birthday on May 14th. It hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. But I'm going to pray for you, and I want everyone to just pray for all the families that we can get through this because right now, almost a year later, I still feel like my life will never be the same, ever. It'll never be the same. Thank you. I'm sorry for your loss. I need to go. 
I'm not going to be nice. My name is Barbara Massey. I'm Catherine Massey's sister. You killed my sister. Cat, I'm going to tell you about my sister, Cat. Cat weighed 110 pounds, 72 years old. Cat would do anything for anybody, anytime. Cat was intelligent. She was a teacher. She was my best friend. She was anything at any given time. Cat was a protector. If Cat saw you, she probably went in her pocket and gave you some money, even though you didn't need it. Cat was an aunt. She was a great aunt. She was a cousin. She was a friend. Cat said she was a committee of one. There's nothing Cat wouldn't do for people. I want personally to choke you and leave my fingerprints on your neck because it was unnecessary. You leave 200 miles to come to Buffalo. You don't even know any black people. 95.7, that's what they said for the citizens in your time. You don't know an Indian, a Mexican, nobody. And your little punk ass decided to come and kill my sister. I talk to Gat every single day. You don't make Gat happy, kid. Gat didn't have any children, but she said she had 34,000. That was the number of kids in school. Gat had so many children, our mind went boom with her own money. There's nothing Cat would do for anybody. You know what made Cat happy? Us cutting grass that we don't even own. That made my sister happy. That's what I was doing when you killed Cat. I was doing her lawn. I was there eight hours with my family, begging the cops, is my sister okay? You threw off her fucking back of her head, man. You okay? 110 pounds, 72 years old. I want to, you better stick those plates. You better say, cop, thank y'all for protecting me because I will hurt you so bad. You have made me sick. You got my family crying. I miss my sister every day. I live three doors down from Cat. I talk to Cat four times a day. My brother Ward goes up there and sit in the park with Cat like to be. My son called Cat triple black because she was so proud of her heritage. My nephew said, Cat, was a saint among sinners. My sister, Catherine Massey, was a great person. Cat didn't hurt you, anybody. None of their family did. You gonna come to our city and decide you don't like black people. Me, you don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. <laughs>
you want? Let me get everybody calm down first.
Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> During this proceeding uh, is an opportunity for those of you who are most affected by this um, heinous act to address the court and address the defendant. But I am sure that you are all disturbed by <clears throat> the physicality that we've seen in the courtroom here today. And, and I understand that emotion and I understand the anger, but we cannot have that in the courtroom. And I am prepared to give anyone that needs to speak an opportunity to speak. Um, and I know that you need to address some of your comments to the defendant, but we must conduct ourselves appropriately because we are all better than that. And so we will continue with the proceeding at this time. And anyone that is feeling overwhelmed by their emotions, I would ask that you perhaps step out in the hallway and take a moment to gather yourself. But we are here today to allow you to express yourself and I will allow you to do that, but I need you to stay at the podium. We can bring the defendant in, please. The record will reflect that the defendant is uh, present in the courtroom and we are ready to proceed. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Zanetta Everhart and I am here on behalf of my son, Zaire Goodman. On May 14, 2022, my son Zaire Goodman was at work doing what young people do. He was working at his part-time job and then terror struck. 
A terrorist shot Zaire point blank in the neck, and the bullet fragments tore through his body and exited his back. He miraculously survived, but his life is now forever changed. Over the last several months, his life has been all about going to the doctor, seeing therapists, and trying to make peace with knowing that someone came into his community and tried to kill him because of the color of his skin. And then questioning why his life was spared when 10 others did not survive. It is an understatement to say that he has survivor's guilt. He is dealing with the pain that I as a mother cannot heal. The ideology to which this terrorist carried out this attack by some is labeled as a sickness or a disease. It is not. Racism, hatred, and white supremacy are lifestyles that are chosen. On that day, Zaire chose to get up and go to work. And that terrorist chose to drive a few hundred miles to shoot and kill 10 people and seriously injure three others. As humans, we have the ability to decipher right from wrong and make choices accordingly. No matter what choice we make, we have to deal with the consequences of that choice, good, bad, or indifferent. On that day, this terrorist made the choice that the value of a black human meant nothing to him. The disregard he has for human life and the callousness to which he carried out this attack on my son and my community not only makes him a monster, but a coward. Only a hu weak human takes out their pain on others. The world says you have to forgive in order to move on. But I stand before you today to say that will never happen. Forgiveness to me puts this tragedy in the laps of the victims, and I nor my son will accept the responsibility of his terroristic act. This is his and his alone. It is he who will need to ask for forgiveness. As he lay in his cell late at night, when he can't sleep. I hope that he is thinking of the 10 lives that he stole from us. I want him to think about my son, who he shot, and the other survivors. I want him to think about the community he tried to destroy. And when the sun comes up, I want him to know that that is Zaire. That is my son, Zaire, my son Goodman, showing you that what you did to him hurt, but he continues to shine. Whatever the sentence is that he receives, it will never be enough to pay for the damage that he has caused. I hope that he receives the fate that he deserves. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Stephanie. On May 14th at 11 a.m., I was on a Zoom with the group I've been in for years called Erase. Our slogan is Eracism. We seek through person-to-person -person communication to eradicate the disease of racism and white supremacy. A few hours after my Zoom ended, I called my sister to visit with her. She answered the phone. She said, Steph, I'm in an ambulance. I've been shot in the head. If I die, please be there for my children. A lot of people have been killed. Please ask everyone that we know to pray. I begged her to stay on the phone, not knowing if I would ever speak to her again. She hung up and I headed to the airport. It wasn't until I was sitting in the airport, in the plane, that my nephew called and said, Aunt Steph, it was a white supremacist. He filmed the entire thing on live stream. I groaned and roared and screamed so loudly that the plane was delayed in taking off. I roared in pain for my sister, my beautiful sister, pharmacist who was serving in the east side. I never knew if I would see her again. I roared also in pain for my brothers and sisters who do not look like me or like the defendant. I roared in pain because he bought into the lies of this country that somehow, because of the amount of the chemical in our skin, we are superior. We were not even the first ones here in the US. Okay. Our black and brown brothers and sisters endured centuries, not years, centuries of oppression as they built our buildings and produced our crops by which the foundation of this country was built on. 
They continue to endure oppression. Even the Harvard lawyer is mistaken continually in the courtroom for the defendant and not the, not the lawyer. They continue to endure microaggressions. They continue to have their families gunned down simply because of the color of their skin. You heard some of the family members today reading from the Bible, offering forgiveness, offering peace, showing the beauty of their hearts. Yes, you also saw the fury. And for those who serve, who have to ask people to sit, I ask you to do it with an empathy in your heart and an understanding that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we have been looking at our brown brothers and sisters as if they were less than. They are not less than. They deserve our respect. They deserve our radical empathy. They deserve for us to get educated on what we can do to treat them with the respect that they deserve. I'm speaking not only for my sister who served in the East Side. My mother's not with me. She's a teacher on the East Side. She's teaching today. Our father, my late father, was a cancer research scientist, master's and a PhD. He dedicated his life to serving. For the last 30 years on the East Side, he ran a mission helping people that deserve to be here, that deserve to be helped. So I ask you, Judge, I wish you could promise that the defendant would never have access to social media for the time that he's alive. I know that's not practical, but I would ask you, the defendant, please, please consider the possibility that you were wrong and that we are stronger together. Diversity makes us beautiful. If every color in the palette was the same color, we would have no beauty in anything in this world. Diversity in the body makes us strong. If every finger was a pinky, we couldn't do anything. We are stronger together. A house divided cannot stand. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Christopher Braden. It has been less than a year since you attacked me and 12 others that day, along with countless numbers of TOPS employees, customers, and residents of that area. I still remember May 14th, 2022, and everything about it still haunts me. Your actions have completely changed and impacted my life in every aspect. I cannot even begin to feel, describe the feeling of terror I had on that Saturday afternoon when I was attacked by you. I was shot in the leg, um, I was shot on the inside of my leg just above my knee and the bullet exited outside below my knee, taking almost everything with it. Um, the injuries I sustained were severe, but I remained conscious and coherent the entire time. I unfortunately saw a few victims being killed. As I was being taken out of the store after the shooting was over, I saw all the victims where they lay. The visions haunt me in my sleep every night and most days. I cannot get those memories out of my head. Nighttime is the worst for my PTSD. I have night terrors that jerk me awake in the middle of the night, and I'm unable to calm back down to go back to sleep. Loud noises never mottled me before, but they do now. I'm always on edge and hypervigilant about my surroundings, feeling the need to be always on alert and protect myself. I spent 10 days in the hospital, endured four surgeries with two more surgeries to go. My left leg below my knee was nearly lost had it not been for the excellent work of my surgeons and the entire team at ECMC. It takes me at least 15 minutes every morning just to get out of bed because my left leg and foot don't work as they should. Without the brace on my foot, it drags and I am not able to flex it. I have no feeling from my knee down to my toe. Both of these things are permanent. I just started being able to put my own sock on and shoe, although some shoes I still have trouble with. I am frustrated with the things that I haven't been able to do since my injury. I could speak for hours about my injuries and treatment, as well as the permanency of these injuries. The stress of not being able to return to work, the pain I suffered hospitalized that continues to this day, um, extensive rehab I have gone through. However, I would rather talk about being a survivor. I'm still the same person that I was before you did this to me. My scars and pain remind me of how strong I've become. I am more alive and stronger than ever. You haven't taken away my will to live. You haven't broken my spirit. The scars are a constant reminder of what happened to me, but don't define my future. Thank you. Thank you.
morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Brian Talley. I'm here on behalf of Geraldine Talley and my nephew, Mark Talley. Um, Peyton Gendron. Peyton Gendron. The reason I mention your name is because so many people have spoke about it not to say anything, not to mention your name, but you need to be known. You need to be known worldwide. I've done a little history on you too, Peyton. Um, I watched the video, you know, and I just can't believe what can you say, what can you possibly say after putting on a video of killing people? It was like a video game to you. What can you possibly say to anybody? Your words don't mean anything. After this, I'm leaving because I don't want to hear what you have to say. It doesn't make a difference. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. The Willie Lynch doctrine, the making of a slave, it said you take the biggest, the toughest, and the blackest nigger. You take them. You tie a horse to one arm. You tie a horse to the other arm. You tie a horse to one leg and tie a horse to the other leg. And then you rip them apart in front of every slave to let them know what it is. You did that to us. You came into the biggest part, the strongest part of the black community, and you ripped us apart. How can you possibly get any kind of, how can you possibly stand up here and say that you're sorry? That you're sorry, you're playing this whole thing. You planned it, you put it on a video, like it was a video game, and watched it. I watched my sister-in-law get shot by you. I watched it. I went in the tops a couple times, and every time I go in there, only thing plays out in my mind is where you walked, where you shot, what you did. You know, the hatred that you must have in your heart for black people, I will never understand. I don't want to understand it. But I must say this. I pray to God they do not kill you. Because I've been incarcerated. You know, I have. And I know where you're going. Where you're going, solitary confinement for the rest of your life, by yourself, wearing this color green. That's why I wore green today. Because I want you to remember this color. You're going to be wearing this color for the rest of your life. I'm praying that you wear this for the rest of your life. I will say this. My nephew didn't come today because of the hate and the pain that he feel. And I don't blame him. I do not blame him because he's still hurting. This whole community is hurting, man. You know, you broke it, you, you divided this community so much that it's, it, it's painful. We'll never heal for this. Can you imagine, you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're going shopping, and you're going shopping on a graveyard? Because that's what Tops is now, it's a graveyard. Huh? It is a graveyard. Can you imagine going to buy your grocery at Forest Lawn, right in the middle of Forest Lawn right now? Well, that's what you did. And if you look at the community right now on Jefferson Avenue, after all the hype and everything, nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, it's got even worse. It's got even worse. Stores is closed down. The community is totally devastated. And you did this. I, I pray to God for your soul. I forgive you, but I forgive you not for your sake, but for mine and for this black community. I forgive you, because that's the only way we're going to heal. But you can best believe, I will never forget your name. I will follow you, every, every your parole, whenever you, whatever you're going through, I'm going to follow you, just like you followed us, just like you sat down and you followed us. I will always remember your face. I will never, ever forget you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Michelle. My last name is Spite. I lost an aunt on May 14th and a cousin. What are the chances that two of your family members would be in the same place from two different sides of your family? 
this is the first time I really had to process this for myself as I've been an advocate for my families that couldn't be as strong to speak for themselves. The calculated manifesto that you derived, the way that you started on a street that I grew up on. You journeyed down my grandmother's street and then wound up at Tops and killed two of my family members. My cousin Pamela Young, that was, Pearl Young was her mother. She was her only daughter. So I stand here to represent James Young, her son, Damon Young, her son, Pamela Young, her daughter, and all of her grandchildren, Oriana, Greg, Nate, and a host of others. I'm going to read Pamela's statement. She could not be here today. It's entitled Residency. What will take up residency? Will it be May 14th, 2022? Or the court appearance, or every interview, or every time I've had to send my mother's death certificate to an insurance company with the cause of death being multiple gunshot wounds to the head. You didn't shoot her once, but you turned around and shot her two times. So much so that her, her viewing could not even be made by her family. I don't mean strength, great strength. Some mornings I wake up with questions of why my mother. I still recall the day I viewed my mother's body for the final time at the funeral home. Her face held no familiar semblance, and I couldn't even get her wedding ring on her finger because so much of her was distorted. I am jealous of my friends and family because they can remember all the beauty of her smile, and I grapple with my final image. But then I think, what has the right to take a residency in my mind? I remember being an eight-year-old girl traveling with her to UB as she completed her college degree. The experience of watching her earn her degree and realizing that I could attain one. She was my inspiration. I remember my mother's advice on the day of my marriage, her presence at the births of all three of my children. There, also, there was also a time, nearly 15 years ago, when she lived with me for six months. She needed to recover from a major surgery in a home where she could maneuver around easily. My mother spent those months with me and my husband. We drank coffee together and talked for hours. I was so grateful to be able to care for her as she had done for me throughout my childhood. I vividly recall October 31st, 2019, the night my husband passed away unexpectedly. I arrived at her house full of tears. She brushed my hair as I lay on her lap as if I were a five-year-old girl again. I have so many other memories that I've decided to write them in my journal. May 14th will always be a memory of a heinous and monstrous act of violence perpetuated by an angry man against my mother simply because of her race. An act of hatred and white supremacy. But I won't allow it to take up residency in my mind. Not when there is so much more about my mother that deserves residency there. So when my mind is invaded by May 14th, 2022, I will allow the tears to fall and the question of why to utter from my lips. But afterwards, I'll take out my journal to remember all the precious moments with my mother. Two minutes and three seconds won't steal those memories. But Peyton, I hope you are haunted every day and every night. I hope nightmares invade your sleep and convict and conviction be your constant companion. You came to Buffalo with hatred and anger in your heart. You terrorized a community, took the life of my best friend, 
but your anger and hatred is not greater than my love for my mother. Beautiful thoughts of her are in my mind as I write tonight. I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite scriptures and it says, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4 and 8. This will take up residency in my mind. Pamela Young Pritchett. And the final reading on behalf of the Morrison family, um, specifically um, Fred Morrison and his mother, who was 72, who on her birthday buried her son. Thanks, Peyton, for that. Dear sirs, the dreadful afternoon of May 14th was the day my world was turned upside down. My life has been altered in unimaginable ways. The sheer agony I felt waiting at the Mikowski School for the confirmation that my brother was one of the victims of this senseless massacre by a white supremacist is riveting. I never imagined my best friend, my only left brother, one who I shared holidays, birthdays, football game days, and most remarkably, our most precious gift we share in our mom. Now, all mom and I have left are a million questions of why, tons of lifeless pictures and a plethora of distant memories and countless tears of insurmountable pain. Thank you for that, Peyton. Oftentimes, my daily struggle is the feeling of not even wanting to live my life without him. Margus and I were inseparable. Margus was the middle son, the only living brother I had the one that fiercely protected me and my mother. He was preceded in death by my eldest brother who died suddenly from a heart attack. Now guess what, Peyton? I'm reliving the pain of loss all over again on an entire new level. Since his murder, I sometimes find myself challenged by not being able to sleep soundly, paranoia going through stores, and in my daily routine, always watching my back as if there was a target attached to me. The added responsibility of being the primary caretaker for our mother who suffered a stroke, in case you were concerned, and losing capacity to speak. I'm now left as the only child and pillow she sheds her tears of missing her baby boy Marcus Morrison on. No mother, no mother should have to bury their child, but my mother, buried her son, Margus, on her 72nd birthday. And Margus' daughter buried her dad on her 16th birthday. I hope you spend the rest of your life, every second, every minute, every hour, rehearsing the daunting sound of the screams and the echoes of the lives you snuffed out. I pray that when you blink your eyes, Peyton, you close them at night to sleep and you see images of the slain and feel the burden of the sorrow from every family member and friend of the fallen loved ones in our entire community of 514. I pray that every second and every minute of your 24 hours will haunt you as the absence of my brother at every birthday, holiday, game day, family gathering, and all the other times we shared. They have now become nothing but gloom and grueling for me and my family. The fact that you can sit in this courtroom with no remorse, flat affect, emotionless, shows the essence of your privilege, sir. One that my brother never had and never will. The fact that you are surrounded by white officers after you casually surrendered while my brother's blood drained from his body is a testament to society that we have a long way to go. And some people's blood is just not as important as others. 
That's the reason you lived. And you have the privilege of being protected. Needless to say, there is one, and I must address you, there is one Peyton that sees all, and you will not escape the fury of the Almighty. One scripture is true in the Bible, and that is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and he will repay. I pray he is merciful because I too need mercy. So I pray he is merciful to let you live so that you can be reminded of the innocent blood that my brother shed behind your calculated, sinister, demonic act that caused my beloved brother to be snatched from our family. If you don't know God, Peyton, I invite you to find him because you are going to need him. With deep sorrow, Fred Morrison, brother of Marcus Morrison. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So I want to start off with saying my dad was Andre McNeil. He um, went to that store to get a cake for my little brother because May 14th is his birthday, my little brother's birthday. And he turned three years old and he didn't get to celebrate his birthday with his dad because he never came back. So um, I was told to write an impact statement. First I was being selfish. And I said I wasn't going to do it, but then I remember I wasn't doing it for this selfish coward or the courts or the press, but I was doing it for my dad, my best friend who was snatched from this world because of something he couldn't change, the color of his skin. After I lost my Uncle Bebe, my dad's brother, I made my dad promise me to stay on top of his house because I didn't want to lose him. And even though we had separation in life, once we did rekindle, we were inseparable. I called him for literally everything, especially when I wasn't getting my way because I knew he would make a way. But most of all, I would be lost without him because I finally found somebody who understood me to a T. We thought a lot alike. And even though he had to be dead before a friend, I always respected everything he said. He was so wise and he made the world easier to live in because he had all the answers to my wild questions. When I was around him, I wanted, I wanted to know his every move, where he was going, what he was doing, and I made sure I tagged along. And the one time he leaves without me, he doesn't come back. After this happened, I constantly beat myself up about him going, and I'm still pissed off because he wasn't given a chance to fight. He was blindsided. You hit him and he didn't even know he got hit. He was blindsided by a hateful death at the hands of a selfish boy who was obviously not educated on the history of African Americans. And because of you murdering my dad, I'm pissed and I'm sad and I hate you. And I didn't think I would be strong enough to look you in the face and tell you this and how much you hurt me. My little brother who's three years old got to grow up without his dad. His brothers, my dad's sisters, his nieces, nephews, his grandkids. Our dad, the man who created us, was killed by a little boy who was obviously raised by hateful people. And I hate your parents too, so let them know that. And there's nothing in this world, no amount of money, anything anyone can say that'll change how I feel. This is the worst way to lose someone. So close to you and I'll never forgive you. And I don't have it in me because no matter what, it wasn't my time, it wasn't my dad's time to go. And who are you to think you control that? My father, Andre McNeil Sr., his name will live on until the day I die. So you, I don't know what else to say to you. I just hope you feel bad. I really do. And I hope, I just hope you go through it in prison. That's all I got to say. Thank you.
Good morning. Hello. Hello. I'm Zion Elliott. I am Andre McNeil's brother. Andre, me and Andre are 11 months and 8 days apart. On the 28th, I'll turn 53. On March 8th, he'll turn 54. Peyton, you took this from me. You took the last of my line. My mother died three days before 9-11. My brother, baby brother died in 2017. My father died in 2017. I'm all that's left besides my baby sister. But what I grew up with, you took from me, which was my brothers, my, my last, the oldest, the only one I had, the only one I could go to. You know, I became homeless. And he came in and found me and got me, brought me to his house. And shortly thus, after that, you know, he planned a party for my nephew and asked me to be here, you know, because of my work and trying to better my life. I didn't make it. But any other thing and any other day that he's in Auburn is where he lived. We were born and raised in Buffalo. Yes, we are from Buffalo. Yes, this is our home. So you took a lot from me. When you came into Buffalo and you drove past Auburn, you know, because Conklin's not that far Auburn. from Auburn, actually. I don't understand why, you know, you came all the way to Buffalo when there was a million different black communities. But you shouldn't have came anywhere. You should have sat in your car first and thought about your actions. As an 18-year-old, I don't know how you could even continue on. I don't know who helped you, who talked you into it. You know, because I know a lot of 18-year-olds, white boys, so you know this. I know a lot of 18-year-old Caucasian, little friends of mine, I call them little homies. None of them are racist, so I'm confused. Especially the three that I know from Conklin, where you're from. So I'm confused on how you got past everybody with your ideology and all this nonsense you have all these protectors of you but so that you know that they're here now where you're going i've been and your own kind's going to get you just so you know i've been in that prison your own kind is going to get you everything that you think that you know about prison and whatever they told you is a lie. Trust me, I've been there. You can ask anybody here to look up my name and they'll find three different New York State ID numbers, which you're about to be. And your own kind's gonna get you. They're gonna befriend you. They're gonna do you real filthy. That's the sad part about it. But you took 53 years from me. You took the last of my life from me. All that I grew up with, all that I know is gone. All of it. He was all I had left. And you came in here in New Buffalo on May 14th and took that from me. I'll never understand why. I don't think anybody will. But you will get what you got coming. You will. That is a promise. As someone said, vengeance, God says vengeance is mine. He'll get you. He will get you for all of us. Do I hate you? No. Do I want to hurt you? Yes. And trust me and believe. These dudes can't stop me, really. I'm the littlest thing in here and very agile but I don't want to hurt you. And I don't, I got nine children, 10 children I got to go home to. Andre had five. And he can't even, they can't even see him anymore. And my nephew, my three-year-old nephew, every day, he's calling for his father. And he, and he, and he can't, and he's not coming. You know how bad that hurts? 
You know, it, it's sad when I got to ignore my nephew's phone calls to tell him his daddy's not coming. It's sad. Because that's all he wants to know. And I don't have an answer. But you took a lot from me. You took a lot from my family. But me, the last, I have no mother, no father, no brothers anymore. You know what you took? I don't understand. Thank you. Your Honor, you've had an opportunity to hear from some of the victim's family members. They've spoken about the effect that this heinous, racially motivated act had on them, their family members, their friends, and their community. However, there are additional family members you've not heard from today. Some uh, wrote statements and chose not to speak. Others could not bear to write a statement and relive one of the most traumatic events of their lives. I would like to speak on behalf of all of those personally affected who chose not to submit a statement. And then I'd like to speak on behalf of the DA's office. Hayward Patterson's family members did not wish to speak today and did not submit a victim impact letter. Nonetheless, I can assure this court that their reluctance to speak or write a letter is because of how difficult this process is which everybody has seen today. Everyone who was in TOPS on May 14th of 2022 or knew someone who was killed on that day has experienced trauma that is not easy to speak about. Their absence is not an indication that they don't care about the outcome or that they've simply moved on. In actuality, it's an indication that they are still recovering and learning to cope and cannot yet bring themselves to confront the defendant or even articulate all of their feelings in a letter. I'd like to focus on the people who were at Top Supermarket on the day of the attack for a moment. While there are many people who escaped that horrible event alive and physically unharmed, they will be scarred emotionally for the rest of their lives. I visited the Top Supermarket where this all occurred in the aftermath of the incident, and it certainly had an immediate effect on me and I was only present for a limited amount of time. I can't imagine what the survivors of this incident were going through during the incident as they remained hidden and quiet, hoping and praying that the defendant didn't find them and end their lives too. This time, Your Honor, I'll speak on behalf of the DA's office. On May 14th of 2022, this defendant displayed a callous disregard for human life. He drove over 200 miles out of his way with one mission, with one goal, to kill as many black people as possible. During that three hour drive, he could have turned around, but he wouldn't be deterred. He was steadfast to accomplish his goal of killing as many black people as possible and starting a race war. He fed into propaganda and lies that convinced him that somehow these innocent people who he had never heard of, who had never heard of him, who had never had a conversation with him, who had never even met him, were a threat to his very existence and identity as a white man. The defendant executed 10 people and wounded three others in slightly over two minutes. The only time he expressed a scintilla of remorse or regret is when he apologized to Christopher Braden, a white man, for shooting him. Any statement of expression 
or remorse at this point, any tears fall flat in the face of such violent actions. And I wholeheartedly believe that the only other regret that the defendant has is that he didn't kill more black people before he was apprehended by Buffalo police officers. In fact, the defendant was so sure of his beliefs, which were based on lies and propaganda, that he live streamed his attack with the goal of inspiring others to commit similar attacks, with the goal of tearing this community down, with the goal of spreading hatred and fear. He failed. This community is pulled together. People of all races, sexual orientations, and religions working together to show love and unity for one another. On May 14th of 2022, 10 beautiful and innocent lives were violently taken from their family, friends, and community because the defendant subscribed to hateful ideology. However, their legacy won't be as victims struck down by someone with unfathomable hatred in his heart. But instead, it'll be as a beacon of light that has brought love to this community, that made this community stronger, that united people of all races throughout our community and our country. The defendant's legacy, on the other hand, will be of a cowardly murderer who killed unarmed citizens. The defendant thought that this would create enough tension to start a race war, that we would turn on each other, he thought that everyone has as much hate in their hearts as he does. But he was wrong, and again, he failed. This community showed that they are not as ugly as the defendant's hateful ideology, and instead of choosing violence, they chose love. They showed the world that the love of this community will always be stronger than white supremacist hatred. And hopefully, the defendant will have to live with his failure for the rest of his life in a jail cell while this community continues to flourish. Your Honor, this sentencing is an opportunity to say no to racism, to say no to hate. Our chance to hold this defendant accountable and show others that think like the defendant that these acts have no place in our society and that there will be dire consequences for anyone who tries to follow in his footsteps. I ask your honor to do what justice demands, to sentence this defendant to the maximum possible sentence allowable by our laws in New York State, to sentence him to a period of life without parole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. <coughs> Excuse me. Have the people had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation, and is there anything you'd like to make a record about with regard to that? We have had an opportunity to review it, and we have nothing to add, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Anything uh, further from the people? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Parker. <coughs> I want to acknowledge that today is what I can only imagine. One of many solemn days in the lives of the survivors and the family members of those who died. Their words are heart-wrenching. Their loss, unimaginable. Only those who have lived it can truly understand their anguish. For the devastation that he caused, Peyton Gendron will be sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison with no possibility of ever being released. Our client committed these terrible crimes. He is responsible for his actions. And he will be held accountable. And he will suffer the consequences for what he did. This case highlights, however, a much deeper problem. This young man's violent, hate-fueled assault was in part the product of centuries of pervasive racism and discrimination in this country. 
these problems need to be addressed, just as many others have publicly demanded since this terrible event took place. Unfortunately, neither this proceeding nor any criminal trial can expose or address the historical racism that set the stage for our clients' horrible acts. We, as a community, need to have those conversations in our legislative bodies and in our living rooms to achieve meaningful change. We know that some of the families and their lawyers have asked for the information collected by law enforcement during their investigations of this crime. We support that request. We hope the resolution of this case brings the day for that information to be shared closer. The racist hate that motivated this crime was spread through online platforms. And the violence that was made possible was in part due to the easy access of assault weapons. Still, our client is responsible for this crime. He will spend the rest of his life locked away, and eventually he will die in state prison. We hope that knowing he will never be free again will offer some small bit of comfort to those that he hurt so much. Some of those most affected by his crime have expressed a need to know whether our client is remorseful. Remorseful for what he did and the devastation that he caused. We are aware, however, that for others, any expression of remorse would be meaningless and the very sight of him or the sound of his voice can be painful. At this time, he has a brief statement to make. His words are not in any way intended to inflict any further pain on those that have already suffered, and we hope that they do not do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. very sorry for all the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Looking back now, I can't believe I actually did it. I believed what I read online and acted out of hate. I know I can't take it back, but I wish I could. And I don't want anyone to be inspired by me and what I did. You don't be none of that shit! Has the defense had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation, and is there any record you wish to make with regard to that? Uh, Judge, we have had a chance to review the pre-sentence report, and we have no comment on it at this point. Is there any further comment the defense wishes to make? No, we are ready for sentencing. All right. I would like to thank you all for being here. And to thank those of you who have shared your thoughts and feelings with the courts, either in writing or in open court here today. It is very meaningful to me 
and I believe that it is important for the defendant and the world to hear what you have to say. I am very sorry for your losses and the pain that you feel. I would like to recognize the heroic officers of the Buffalo Police Department who without hesitation ran towards the danger of an active shooter call, swiftly and professionally stopping and containing the defendant and putting an end to his evil rampage. Thank you. I have spent a lot of time thinking about this case. Our community, our nation, how we got here and where we go from here. It all comes down to character and having the strength to stand up for what is right. Our character is not defined by the good and easy times. It is defined by the hard and challenging times. And often, our character is revealed not necessarily by what we say, but by what we do. I am both immensely proud of and grateful for the way Buffalo has rejected the evil and hate that was inflicted on our community. The character of good people throughout this city, county, state, nation, and even internationally, has shown through as they have stood with the victims of this heinous and cruel act. This indictment speaks to the 13 victims and their families that lost the most, but they are not the only victims. There are thousands that have been traumatized directly and vicariously by this defendant's actions. We have seen the community turn out in support and are seeing signs of much needed change in East Buffalo. It is a testament to the power of love and compassion to overcome evil and hate by turning pain into purpose but it is just the beginning. We have a long way to go. This hateful act and other similar hateful acts across the country, motivated by white supremacy and replacement theory, are a reckoning for us as a nation. The ugly truth is that our nation was founded and built in part on white supremacy, starting with the treatment of Native Americans by the first European settlers, to the cruel, inhumane, economic engine, nation-building practice of slavery, to indentured servitude, to Jim Crow laws, to government policies creating segregated public housing with communities of color often placed in environmentally hazardous locations, to the manner in which expressways were built, dividing urban neighborhoods to create easy access to government subsidized developments in the suburbs with restricted covenants prohibiting the sale of suburban homes to African Americans to redlining practices in communities of color, further devaluing those neighborhoods, to the GI Bill, a well-deserved financial boon to our servicemen, unless, of course, you were a serviceman of color, to the war on drugs and mass incarceration, disproportionately of men of color, to the school to prison pipeline, 
to inequities in education, employment opportunities, and compensation, to the existence of food deserts and inaccuracies in health care. Our history is replete with both individual and systemic discriminatory practices many of them still firmly in place today. In fact, it is these very policies and practices that contributed to and made this atrocity possible. The effects of these policies, some current and others decades and centuries old, created the segregation in our city and enabled this defendant to research and identify his target to maximize the impact of his evil intent. All of these policies and systems, either sponsored or tolerated by the government and implemented by individuals, were designed to destroy the very fabric of family life, opportunities for success, the creation of generational wealth, and even the mere existence of hope in communities of color. The harsh reality is that white supremacy has been an insidious cancer on our society and nation since its inception. And it undermines the notions of a meritocracy and the land of opportunity that we hold so dear. However, white supremacy is not inevitable or unstoppable. It has been carefully cultivated and nurtured by individuals and the government for centuries. This is the history that we have all inherited. It has been passed down from generation to generation. We must acknowledge that history. See that history for what it is. Recognize it. And learn from it, or we are doomed to repeat it. Let ours be the generation to put a stop to it. We can do better. We must do better. Our own humanity requires it. As an individual, we must call out injustice in our daily lives when we see it. We must reject racism in all of its forms. We must be conscious of the power of our words and actions and the impact they have on those around us both intended and unintended. We must demand better of our public servants in their efforts to address inequity. And we must embrace government policies aimed at creating and fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion. We must make the outpouring of support, love, and compassion that followed this heinous act an everyday practice. We are stronger together. These are hard and challenging times. Our characters are being tested. The future of our nation is at stake. Are we up to the challenge? I believe that we are. In the words of Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman, there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Mr. Gendron, please stand. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, 
and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. It is the judgment of this court for your conviction under the first count of the indictment, a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate in the first degree, an A1 felony, that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Under the second count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Roberta Drury, a vibrant 32-year-old young woman, a daughter, a dedicated sister, and friend, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the third count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 67-year-old Hayward Patterson, a son, father, and friend, known as a faithful, hardworking, generous, well-dressed man, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the fourth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 77-year-old Pearl Young, a daughter, mother, grandmother, and friend, known for being a loving, dedicated substitute teacher, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the fifth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 86-year-old Ruth Whitfield, a daughter, sister, wife, mother, and grandmother, a dedicated caretaker, an avid fisherwoman, and a valued member of her church community. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the sixth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Celestine Cheney, a daughter, sister, mother, aunt, grandmother, and friend, a fighter who at 65 had beat cancer and multiple aneurysms, a person who enjoyed life and laughed easily. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the seventh count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Aaron Salter, age 55, a son, brother, husband, and father, a car guy, and a lover of camping, a retired Buffalo police officer, heroic and selfless to the very end. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the eighth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 53-year-old Andre McNeil, a son, brother, uncle, father, and fiance, devoted Miami Heat fan, survived by a three-year-old son. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the ninth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Margus Morrison, age 52, a son, brother, husband, and father. He loved music and sneakers. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the 10th count of the indictment, 
murder in the first degree for the murder of 72-year-old Catherine Massey, Cat, a daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, an activist known for her sincerity, thoughtfulness, and honesty. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the 11th count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Geraldine Talley, age 62, a daughter, mother, and aunt, the life of the party, and a top-notch baker. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. By operation of law, the sentences on counts 2 through 11 must run concurrently with the sentence imposed on the first count. Under the remaining counts of the indictment to which you pled, the law permits me, based on your age, to consider granting you youthful offender status. The purpose of youthful offender status under the law is to prevent the stigmatization of young offenders based on hasty and thoughtless acts and to provide them a fresh start <clears throat> and a renewed opportunity to be a law-abiding productive member of society. However, given the manner in which you methodically planned, researched, conducted recognizance, and executed your hateful crimes, a finding of youthful offender status is not appropriate. There has, was nothing hasty or thoughtless about your conduct. There are no mitigating factors to be considered. You will be sentenced as an adult on the remaining counts. Under the 22nd count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree, for the attempted murder of 20-year-old Zaire Goodman, a beloved son, a hardworking young man of character. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 23rd count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree, for the attempted murder of 55-year-old Christopher Braden, a son, father, husband, and friend, a professional serving the needs of the good people of the city of Buffalo. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 24th count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree for the attempted murder of Jennifer Warrington, age 50, daughter, mother, wife, friend, a professional serving the needs of the good people of the city of Buffalo. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 25th count of the indictment, criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree, I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 15 years followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. I am assessing the mandatory surcharge of $300, the crime victim assistance fee of $25, and a DNA fee of $50. You have 30 days to appeal the sentence of this court. This concludes these proceedings, and the court will stand in recess.